Yeah, I want to pull this up. I found this study interesting. So it is. It it sounds like you believe it does have some clinical utility, and a finding like this might be sort of something to pay attention. This is impact of an eight week linoleic acid intake in soy oil on LPPLA two in active healthy uh, activity in healthy adults. And the conclusion: an increase in plasma linoleic acid following intake of soy oil was independently associated with LPPLA two activity which was also related to ApoB, OxLDL, and CEPICT, which is, I believe is a measure of um, endothelial function, this collagen epinephrine closure time. Are you familiar with that one? I haven't seen that one before, but I'll, I'll look it up. Inter- yeah, yeah. But I thought that was so interesting. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> but I'll just, I'll just say there, I mean, do you, do you think there's some discordance here? Because wouldn't wouldn't most mainstream cardiologists recommend soybean oil because it lowers LDL? Um, honestly, I don't know what they recommend. I, mean, I, I don't really follow a lot of the AHA guidelines. I mean, they're usually in 20 <laughs> yeah. years behind and I'm trying to look forward. Um, but, you know, I think it sometimes gets in the weeds where people really get concerned about this stuff is, you know, focus on a whole food diet. Like, you know, what would your great grandparents have had access to if they were eating this stuff? you're probably evolved to be able to eat this. And sometimes people overthink it. You know, if it's highly processed, it's probably not that good for you. And there's some people that are going to be Superman. They can, you know, be a garbage disposal and they can eat anything and nothing bad's going to happen to them. But the majority of people can't do that. So I would agree with you. Like I would not be trying to hammer a ton of soybean oil. I just don't, I wouldn't do it to true. Also, the thing about it, you mentioned like the lower LDL, like is that clinically useful? Does it lower ApoB? Does it improve endothelial function? That'd be interesting. But if it doesn't do those things, I don't really care what it does to LDL cholesterol. Yeah, I find it so interesting. Um, and then we'll get into LP little a because mm-hmm. my experience is that most cardiologists that I've talked to, that I've heard speak, um, either on podcasts about lipids, you know, want LDL, they want ApoB to be as low as possible. And, and one way to do that is to ingest seed oils. <laughs> and one way to raise one way to raise ApoB a little bit or moderately is to eat saturated fat and to not eat seed oils. I mean, there's a clear pattern that I've seen in myself and countless people that I've worked with and countless people who have sent me their labs that the less polyunsaturated fatty acids you eat, and this may have to do with the homeoviscous model or this membrane fluidity or the LDL receptor, the less polyunsaturated fatty acids you eat, especially the omega-6s like linoleic acid, and the more of the saturated fats that you eat, I'm getting saturated fat from animal fat so tallow, butter, ghee, animal fat in my burgers and my steaks, the LDL goes up. Now, it doesn't go up massively. Um, I'm eating fruit now. I, w- I definitely want to talk about Dave Feldman's stuff a little bit. Um, when I'm not in ketosis, um, which I'm not in much anymore because I'm eating fruit and honey mm-hmm. as carbohydrates, I do think my LDL is lower. And I've seen that. It's 160 to 170 milligrams per deciliter. We saw my ApoB was 121, I believe, earlier. But so I think that if I... I could, I'm pretty sure I could lower my ApoB by eating some canola oil right. and eating less and eating less butter. But it would be so interesting. And I, I don't really want to do this experiment, but I think the experiment should be done where that's happening and people are actually looking at some of these metrics like you're talking about of endothelial function, looking at LPPLA2, looking at LP little a, which we know goes up when people eat more seed oils, looking at oxidized LDL, which we know goes up when people eat more seed oils, and looking at, you know, it is brachial artery reactivity, whatever metric we want to look at here and saying, maybe we're missing the forest for the trees here, guys. Like this is, this is why the mainstream discussion of LDL kind of grinds my gears a little bit. Um, you want to tell us about LP little a, because this one's pretty important. I think it's very important. And it's something that unfortunately I also didn't learn about in my traditional training. Um, (laughs) yeah. So lipoprotein little a, it's a lipoprotein. It's basically an LDL particle that has an extra protein stuck on the outside of it. I tell patients it kind of looks like a corkscrew. It's got this weird name. It's called Kringles. You know, the longer your Kringles, the less of them you make, the shorter the Kringles, the more of these LPA proteins you're probably making. So LPA is made in your liver or lipoprotein, little a. 20% of the population or up to 20% of the population has lipoprotein little a that's elevated. It depends on which lab you're doing, but most of the time the cutoff is 75 millig- uh, milligrams per deciliter. Um, Lipoprotein little a is the number one genetically inherited lipoprotein that increases the risk of early cardiovascular disease. So Bob Harper, the guy from The Biggest Loser who had a heart attack in the gym, looked super fit on the outside. He had very high levels of lipoprotein little a. And it's one of those things that's not going to get picked up 
on your traditional cholesterol panel. Quick side note is, you know, if you're quote, eating healthy and exercising and you still have a high LDLC and you don't have access to the particle count, well, part of that LDLC is going to be miscalculating it as LPA. It's going to, and you're not going to be able to do anything from a nutrition standpoint to be lowering that LDLC at that point. So you have to actually measure the lipoprotein A. It's not a very expensive test. I believe it's less than $20 at most labs. And you only need to check it one time in your life for the most part. If it's low, it's always going to be low. If it's high, it's probably not going to change much from that baseline. It, there's a, some variance, but it has a pretty much a it's pretty set genetic set point. And it's one of those things where it's like LDL particles, but with that extra protein on the outside of it, it allows it to dig into that endothelial glycocalyx a little bit easier. So it damages the glycocalyx. It gets stuck there. There's some debate on what exactly the function of LPA was, but it has an effect on uh, your clotting abilities. So maybe it was conserved in our gene pool because it helped certain mothers not bleed to death during childbirth. And maybe that's why there's one in five people of us carrying this stuff around. But it's thought of as a scavenger molecule. It's eating up all these oxidized phospholipids. So it's kind of like a garbage truck. They don't think, I don't think they know exactly how the lipoprotein A particles get out of circulation. There's probably some receptor on the liver that they haven't fully elucidated, or maybe it eventually jams itself into an LDL receptor and is able to get out. But if that lipoprotein A, which is like a garbage truck full of oxidized phospholipids, makes its way into your intima, we basically now have an, you know, a, a nuclear bomb in your artery wall that sets off this huge inflammatory cascade. And so anytime I see somebody who has a high calcium score test in their 40s, or they've already had an event, unfortunately, I'm always looking at it at first because, you know, if you're guessing by stats, one in five of those people are going to have a high level. Yeah, just so people remember, mine was 25, I think we saw earlier. Normal. And I, I wanted to mention earlier that something we touched on in the podcast, I did have a CT or a, a CAC score. So I had a calcium score, not as good as a CT coronary angio, but I had a coronary artery mm -hmm. calcium score uh, in 2020 and it was zero. At that point, I was 42 or 43, I believe. And um, interestingly, you know, my father had an angioplasty when he was about that age. So I certainly have a family history of accelerated coronary artery disease. At that point in my life, my LDL was 500, um, but my CAC was zero. I probably should have another one. I don't want right. to do them that often. There's a small amount of radiation. Right. I'd like to get a CT coronary angio. What, what do you recommend for people who have a genetically high LP little a? This kind of baffles me a little bit. I think there must be more to this story um, going on, you know, may, maybe it's, if you have a genetically high LP little a, and you're doing something negative in your lifestyle, or is this just a really bad poker hand? I can't parse it out. It's very interesting. And just, you know, over the 10 years, I've been a cardiologist. I've, you know, had hundreds of patients with LP little a, so you kind of get to see the natural course of it. There's some instances where LPA is the, you know, the, you know, you know fire that's, you know, driving the plaque formation. And there's other people that have excessively high LPA. And they don't have, you know, events. They don't have high calcium scores or CT angios. So what is the differentiator? In my estimation, it's probably more that those people don't have endothelial dysfunction. They don't have, you know, those markers that LPPLA2. If that LPPLA2 is elevated, that tends to mean that that lipoprotein A particle is going to have a lot of, you know, toxic waste in it. And then if you can assess either the oxidized LDL or preferably the oxidized phospholipid on ApoB, if that's elevated, then it's kind of like fire and dynamite. You think that LPA is probably pretty metabolically active at that point. So those are the people I can put in the super high risk bucket. But here's where it gets kind of disconcerting. There's no great treatments for lipoprotein A at this point. You know, people want to use niacin. Maybe niacin has a 10%, maybe 20% reduction in it. But you really got to get to be like 90% more reduction to really have a clinical benefit. You know, there's drugs in development. They're called antisense oleonucleotides. Right. They essentially work in the liver by turning off the machinery that puts on that corkscrew protein onto an LDL particle. And so the numbers drop by like 95%. So they show that it can drop it to almost, you know, undetectable. What they're currently doing in phase two trials is figuring out, are people going to have less events? Yeah. You know, are they going to have less heart attacks, strokes and such? You now that's, you know, going to be wrapping up at the end of 2023, I believe. So if people have had multiple events and they have high lipoprotein LA, well, there's probably something coming for you in a year or two that may be beneficial. But until the meantime, you just have to try to fix all the other things you can fix. Keep inflammation as low as possible. You know, reverse insulin resistance if it's present. Keep the oxidation under control. And then LPA, 
probably doesn't have a lot of things to go out there to scavenge at that point. So what, what I'm hearing, Mike, is that if your cardiologist is not doing fasting insulin, looking at your endothelial health, looking at your HSCRP, looking at your fasting blood glucose, looking at your LPPLA2, looking at your LP little a, probably looking at your ApoB and your particle number, uh, screening you for thyroid disease, insulin sensitivity, like we talked about, and other things that, 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 that they may not be getting the whole picture is, is, is what, I, what I consistently hear here. And I, I agree with that completely. And I think that um, it's a great sadness of mine that most cardiology practice that I'm aware of today is, is quite myopic. It, it literally has blinders. Like they just get a lipid panel. What is your ApoB? That's what we do. And they're not getting all these other labs. Are they? They're not really getting the whole picture. Not generally. And I've been doing these you know, advanced labs for 10 years in my practices. And you know, up until three years ago, I was still rounding in the hospital taking care of really sick people. But my passion is really kind of going through these advanced testing, explain to people what's going on in their biochemistry, what they could do from a lifestyle standpoint, what they could supplement if needed, and then using the, you know, the pharmacological agents as needed, but trying to wean them off that when it was appropriate. You know, I won't fault my you know, general cardiovascular colleagues. I mean, heart disease is still the number one thing taking people out. There's way too many people having heart attacks. I think the number's still like every 40 seconds, somebody's having a heart attack in you know, the United States. So they're busy head down treating all these events. And they're just throwing kitchen sinks at people. You know, I did, like I said, I recertified in my you know, cardiovascular disease uh, testing recently. There's new drugs that came out since the last time I was really using this stuff. And there's amazing drugs that can keep people alive longer, but they're not necessarily going to be preventive. They're just putting band-aids on people at that point. Um, and it's amazing that they're able to extend people's lives. But I always kind of talked about it like when I was in the cath lab. You know, it was amazing to be able to save people's lives, you know, right on the brink of them dying. But why do we have to wait so long? You know, why did we, you know, prevent Humpty Dumpties from falling off the wall in the first place? And so that's where my head's gone for the past few years is use these tests, use the endothelial function test to tell people this is what's going on right now. And if you make an intervention right now, you're not going to end up on our cath lab tables. Western medicine doesn't do a very good job of that, man. No. So thanks for that. <laughs> I appreciate what you're doing. I found um, this article. I just wanted to share it and see what you thought. So this one I thought was interesting. Have you seen this? Plasma LP little a levels in men and women consuming diets enriched in saturated cis or trans monounsaturated fatty acids. And the conclusion, um, the saturated diet lowered LP little a levels significantly um, by eight to 11%. I thought that was interesting compared to the oleic diet. The trans diet had no adverse effects on LP little a uh, levels when all subjects were considered collectively. Um, so they say thus in amounts commonly found in the US diet, saturated fatty acids, uh, can consistently decrease LP little a, uh, the adverse, uh, the adverse effects of replacing cis with trans fatty acids are only suggestive and restricted to high trans intakes in subjects with high LP little a levels. I'm pretty sure this headline didn't make the news. Um, <laughs> imagine that, right. uh, what if saturated fat is good for humans? Right. Or not as negative as people are demonizing it. Yeah. yeah. And it would make sense that, uh, having some saturated fat in your diet could create a more stable, particle, less fatty acids in the particle to become oxidized. But that was the one thing that I'd heard about that could lower LP little a was increasing saturated fat. Now that's, that's from the AHA. I mean, that's uh, what journal is that? That's arteriosclerosis, thrombosis of vascular biology. That is a mainstream cardiovascular mm -hmm. journal. And here they're saying saturated fat can lower your LP little a guys. So again, that, that might be what we've come back to, you know, if your grandmother couldn't eat it, or your great grandmother or your great great grandmother, probably, then you probably shouldn't eat it. And guess what? None of our great great grandmothers were eating seed oils. They were all eating animal fat. So, uh, yeah, I think that that's a reasonable thing. You can take that to your cardiologist. Anyone listening to this who has an elevated LP little a, you should probably go see Dr. Twyman in, <laughs> in St. Louis. But um, if you can't do that and you have uh, that, that problem, you can take this article to your cardiologist and say, maybe I should eat more butter. Right. <laughs> 